Thank you, choir. Jesus is Lord. It's the oldest confession of faith. Jesus is Lord. But the obvious question after that is, so what? So what? And that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. George Whitfield was a well-known preacher in the 18th century. Born in England and spent most of his time in England, but he did spend time in America as well, preaching the gospel. And one of the remarkable things about Whitfield living in the 18th century was that he preached over 18,000 times to over 10 million people. He had tremendous oratorical skills. And when people knew that Whitfield was preaching, they would come in mass. Buildings like this couldn't hold the crowds that would come. And Whitfield became known for his outdoor preaching. When we think about that in modern times, we think about someone like Billy Graham. And George Whitfield would come, and one of the things that he said often was, I am willing to go to prison for you. I, I am willing to die for you, but I am not willing to go to heaven without you. And he would preach the gospel of Jesus Christ in a very compelling way. He had a passion to make Christ known. Now our text for this morning comes from Acts chapter 17. We're going to be looking at verses 22 through 34. Just leave your Bibles open there. Of course, this is about the Apostle Paul. He had a passion to make Christ known as well. He's in Athens. Specifically, he is at a place called the Areopagus. The Areopagus is northwest of the Acropolis, and it's this rock formation that kind of juts out. And when you go out on it and stand out on it, you have a beautiful panoramic view of Athens. I had the opportunity to be there in October of 1996. Carrie and I had gone with a group from our church in Franklinton at that time. We had a wonderful guide. She was uh, an older lady. She reminded me of a school teacher that I had once. She was all business. And I asked her, would it be okay if we had a time of devotion, 10, 15 minutes, there at the Areopagus? And she said, that would be fine. Just go off by yourself over to a corner. And so we did. And of course, this is the text that I used. And I'm sharing with my church group. And, and I noticed that some of the other people, there were probably about 60 or 70 all in total out there, started coming over to where we were. I think they thought I was a tour guide and they'd get some free information. I don't know. But they started coming, and, and then more came, and they were standing around listening. And then I noticed two policemen walking up. And I'm feeling fear because I don't know what the rules are. My guide has said it's okay. And as they're approaching me, it's obvious they're coming to stop me. And she steps in, and she cuts it off right there. And what she says to them, I have no idea. If I had heard it, I wouldn't understand it because she spoke in, in Greek. But she turned them around and off they went. But I remember that and I was thinking about it as I prepared this sermon. Because when you're at the Areopagus, you see all of Athens in front of you. But I think Paul also saw the danger all around him. A little bit of what I was feeling on that particular day. Now, in Paul's day, there was also a group of men, an aristocratic council that met that was called the Areopagus. And they were called that because that's where they met, out on this rock formation. And they were the, the great thinkers of that day. And they were often used to advise those who were in positions of power. 
And so when Paul is talking about the Areopagus, he is talking about that council of men who are very learned, who are very wise, and he is talking to them about what they know because what he wants to do is make the transition to talk to them about what they do not know or more specifically who they do not know, Jesus Christ. So I want us to look at this text, Acts 17, verses 22 through 34, because I think in this story are some lessons that we can learn about witnessing. Because I have found in my ministry that that is an area that most of us find difficult. You know, when it comes to worship, discipleship, fellowship, ministry, missions, all of that we embrace easier than we do evangelism, than we do witnessing and sharing with others. So let's look at this story and see what we can learn. First, verses 22 and 23 of Acts 17. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And, th and this is what I am going to proclaim to you. So the first thing that I see, the first lesson that we can pull from this story is, Paul began where the people were. He met them where they were. And he uses that as the jumping off point for this conversation about faith, about religion, and more specifically, about Jesus Christ. He's, he had taken the tour. He's on his missionary journey. He's walked the city of Athens. He's looked around. It's always a good thing to do, to be aware of your surroundings, to know where you are, and to look and to see what you can see. If you go on a mission trip, it's always a good idea when you get to that place to be very careful, to be very intentional about looking around and seeing what you can observe. And you'll learn a lot about people from that. And what he saw were these different uh, idols that had been put up all over the city. And these people were worshiping every kind of God. Now, why were they doing that? Because they were religious people. They understood that life was more than just what they could see physically. And they believed in gods, plural. They believed in gods. And they had gods for all kinds of things. And they worshiped these gods trying to cover all of their bases. And as Paul takes this tour of Athens and he looks around and he sees all these gods and he's reading about the gods and, and he's learning about what is interesting to the people, he finds this god and it's labeled to an unknown god. And so he uses that as his object lesson just like on Sunday mornings, oftentimes when we have a children's sermon, we have an object lesson, something for them to look at, something for them to focus on to help them be able to connect to the spiritual truth that's trying to be communicated. And so that is exactly what Paul does. He draws their attention to something they all well know. When he talks about this idol to an unknown God, they all know exactly what he's talking about. They can see that idol. They know why it's there. They know what it means to them. And he said, as I was walking around, I looked carefully at your objects of worship, and I found this altar with this inscription to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. Now, when we hear that with our Western ears, it sounds like, Paul is making fun of them. He was not, and they did not hear it that way. He's not putting them down. What they most valued was knowledge. 
That's why this group was together, the Areopagus. They were wise men, wise people. And what they most wanted was knowledge. They thirsted for knowledge. They longed for knowledge. They were looking to learn wherever they could. And so here comes this very educated person. And Paul was. And he says, I want to tell you about something you don't know about. When we hear you're ignorant, that sounds like it's a put down. But for them, it was an invitation. It was an open arm embrace. It was something they wanted. Paul had something that they were looking for, and they were listening. They wanted to know what he knew. Wise people are always learning, always seeking knowledge. And these people were certainly doing that. So Paul begins where they are, and they are interested in religious things. I think for us, we have to be willing to do that as well. Uh, too often we come with our agenda. Instead of really meeting people where they are and getting to know them, I've, I've often said, maybe a better question than starting with, if you die tonight, do you know you're going to heaven? Maybe a better question is, tell me your name. Tell me about your family. Let me hear your story. And as you listen to them share what is important to them, then you find opportunity in that conversation to start where they are and to talk about what is important to you and what has meant a lot to you, your faith in Jesus Christ. I remember as a seminary student, I, you know, I started by saying that we struggle with evangelism. I have found that in most of the church members that I've been pastor of. And I, I've had that in my own life. And I remember going to seminary and just really struggling with that part of the curricula. You know, sharing faith. And I took evangelism courses. And one particular course, we had to learn several different methods of evangelism. Uh, we had to go through this thing called EE evangelism explosion. Uh, there was another one, CWT, Certified Witness Training. Uh, all of them were about memorizing a text. And we would have to stand up in front of the class and the class would be listening to us just as you were listening to me this morning. And, and I would have to give that presentation whether it was evangelism explosion or certified witness training or, or some other presentation, there were a number of them we had to do. But everything was memorized. And for me, it was very mechanical. But we were actually counted off every word that we got out of place or got wrong or if we inserted a word that was more normal for us than the word that was printed that was marked off. And I mean, after all, the goal was to get an A, right? So I learned it, and I stood there, and I said it about like this, and I said every word exactly right, and I got an A. That's no way to do witnessing. That's no way to do witnessing. You, you, you have to talk to people and be normal and be natural, and you have to start where they are. Because if you don't, it's all about you and not about them. And if it's all about you and not about them, don't do it. Don't do it. You have to love them and care about them and want them to know Jesus Christ and want them to experience what you've experienced. And you can only do that by sharing yourself, by being open and vulnerable. When I ask people what they think about witnessing and maybe why they don't witness more, you know what they tell me? I'm afraid I'll say the wrong thing. I'm afraid I'll say the wrong thing. A contemporary of uh, Whitfield's, George Whitfield's, was Charles Wesley. Uh, he wrote a hymn, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. Praise of our great Redeemer. Uh, but the real question is, are we willing to use our, our one tongue to tell others about Jesus? D.L. Moody was an evangelist that kind of rubbed some people the wrong way, just like the Apostle Paul certainly did as well. 
And after a, a crusade that he had in the Chicago area, someone came up to him and said, Mr. Moody, I don't like the way you do evangelism. And uh, Moody was quick and sometimes sharp and said, you know what? I don't like the way you don't do evangelism. There is this responsibility that we have to be a witness for our Lord. And if we're going to be a, a faithful witness, we start where people are. People of Athens. And he looked at them and they were around the Areopagus, that aristocratic group that was there. He was talking to them, but also those who were listening in. I see that in every way you are very religious. That's a starting point. That's a starting point. If their religion is not your religion, that's okay. That's a starting point. That's a starting point. Respect people. Listen to them and talk to them. Meet them where they are. Second thing, talk about God. Don't just leave it there. Don't just say, well, that's interesting. I mean, enter into to the conversation. Verses 24 through 28. Paul says to them, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man, he made all nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. Though he is not far from any of us. For in him we live, we move, we have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Start where they are and tell them about God. Well, if I'm going to tell them about God, where do I start? Paul says start at the beginning. Start with Genesis. That's what he does. In the beginning was God. God is creator. Everything that is in this universe is of God. He is the one who has created all that is. He is the one who has created us. Not only is God creator, but he is the one who guides life. He creates life and he guides life and he is with us in this life. Paul says it is in him that we live and move and have our being. We are dependent on him. For everything, even our next breath. If you're going to begin where people are and you're going to talk to them about God, what do you most have in common? What do we have in common with everyone? Whether it's here in Person County or whether it's in some culture on the other side of the world. What do we have in common? And it's simply this. We are all human beings. We all live in this world as human beings. And our humanity is a connecting point that we can all understand. I can remember growing up, Dad made sure that we worked on the farm. One of the things we had to do was chop cotton. Now, it's not chopping cotton, it's chopping cotton, okay? And when you're chopping cotton, some of you don't know what that's about, never been in a cotton field, it's simple. Your dad gives you a, a hoe, puts you in the pickup truck, takes you to a cotton field. There are cotton stalks there. He says, get out, chop anything that's not a cotton stalk. So when you're chopping cotton, really what you're doing is chopping everything but the cotton, okay, everything around. And I remember one particular day, I was out in the field chopping cotton, and I was chopping at those weeds kind of in slow motion as I would sometimes do, especially as the sun rose higher and higher. And I really wasn't too enthused about being in the field and chopping cotton. I'd rather been out on a baseball field playing baseball, but you know, you do what your father tells you to do. And then I noticed 
a snake two rows over coming right at me, a rattlesnake. And he's slithering across that hot earth and he's coming straight at me. Now, I need to tell you, I'm afraid of snakes. And if I know that they are poisonous, I am very afraid of snakes. I'm not like my brother Brummett that I've told you about who would try to capture snakes. Oh, no. I run from snakes. But this one's coming right at me, and he's coming fast. And I'm afraid. If I had not been afraid, I could have thought clearly. But when you're afraid, you don't think clearly. And if I'd been thinking clearly, I would know that for that snake to strike me, to bite me, it's got to stop. It's got a coil. It's going to rattle. But it wasn't doing any of that. It was just coming. It treated me like I was a tree or something else in its way. But oh no, I'm a thinking person and I've got a hoe in my hand. And I, I just turn around and poof, I'm chopping snake. I hit the first on his head and his head pops off. And I remember that snake jumping in the air at that point. And he's just writhing all over. And he comes down again and I hit him again. And I hit him again. And there is this man who worked on our farm. And you need to know they call my dad Captain. And since I was his oldest son and named after him, they call me Little Captain. He's, and he never seen me chop cotton like that. He knew something was wrong. And so he comes up, Little Captain, Little Captain, what's wrong? I said, I'm killing this snake. And he said, you done killed him. And I said, he is still moving. And I hit him again. And these parts are wiggling around. And he says, you can stop. You can stop. Snakes are like people. They're slow to let loose a life. But you got him. I remember that. Because that's what we have in common, right? I don't care what language you speak. I don't care what kind of clothes you wear. I don't care what kind of food you eat or even what kind of gods you worship. There's something we've got in common. We're human. We have to breathe to stay alive. And we're kind of serious about life. And we want to hold on to life. And so when you go witnessing to folk, you might think, I don't have anything in common with this person. Take a deep breath because you got that in common with them. And it's up to God to give you the next one. And so you meet them where they are and you understand that. And what Paul is really saying to them is, you've tried all these other gods. I, I, I want you, I want to introduce you to one you don't know about. It's going to make all the difference in the world to you. One that has created you. The one that in him you live, move, and have your very being. When you go to life, you're going right to the heart of God. You remember in John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus said, I have come that they might have what? Life. And have it more abundantly. When, when Jesus is getting ready to leave his disciples and they're concerned about it and Thomas is saying, Lord, we don't know the way. We don't know what's happening. We don't know how we're going to be where you are. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Life. Paul's pretty smart. He knows that what is important is life. And what he's doing here is connecting them to the God of life. You have to come right out and say it. Look at verses 29 through 31. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, remember he ended by saying some of your poets have even said this. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. He'd, he'd taken the tour of Athens. He had seen these false gods made out of these materials as if it were a car or a piece of furniture or something. He said, oh, no. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, such lack of knowledge. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. 
He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. So he goes right to the incarnation, really. He doesn't use the word, but he goes right to the incarnation. There, there is one that is different than us. One who has lived here different than us. His name is Jesus. God has appointed him. God has sent him. And even though Jesus was crucified, he was raised from the dead. So he's God in the flesh. He has taken our sin upon himself. He has been crucified, but that's not the end of the story. He has been raised from the dead. Why was Jesus born? And why did Jesus have to die? For our sin. Sin is a reality in the world, and Paul certainly knew that. He said in Romans 3, 23, all sin and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6, 23, and the wages of sin is death. Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know what he's saying? It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about Jesus Christ. It's not about how good we are or how right we get it. It's about how much Jesus loves us. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. What keeps us from having that full abundant life that Jesus talked about in John 10, 10? In a word, sin. Sin. It's what Satan uses to keep us from our relationship with God. And we all have this sin condition. You have to build a relationship. You have to start where people are. But it can't just be niceties and platitudes. What does Paul say here? He calls them to repent. When you didn't know, that was one thing. But now that you do know, you have to repent. He's calling them to leave these other gods that are all over the city. And we say, well, we don't have gods like that that they had in Athens in that day. Where are the people this morning? They're out with their gods. Paul said, this isn't, this isn't a joke. You have to repent. You have to return to God. You, you have to be serious about your own sin and not just justify it. It, it reminds me of a story I heard. It happened in Washington State. There was this big timber cutting project going on on a river in Washington State. And downriver was this timber company that took the, the logs and processed them. And in between the timber cutting and the timber company, there was this community. And the preacher in that community found out that some of the people were fishing some of the logs out of the river. And all the logs were stamped at the bottom with the company's name on it. And they would cut off the company's name, take those logs, and use them to build their own houses. And when the preacher found out about it, he was appalled about it. And so he decided he had to do something, and so the next Sunday he preached. And the title of his message was simply this, Thou Shalt Not Steal. And he preached his heart out to these people, many of them who he knew were stealing the logs. Thou shalt not steal. At the end of the sermon, he didn't see any response. But as the folk left, everyone said, that was a great sermon, preacher. That was a good one. You really preached your heart out today. And when he left, he said, these folks don't get it. So the next Sunday... He was a little more direct. His message was this. Not, thou shalt not steal. It was, thou shalt, shalt not cut the end of other people's logs off. <laughs> that was his last sermon in that church. <laughs> Do we really want truth? And in that question, do we really want Jesus? Because he is truth. Jesus is Lord. Our choir did a beautiful job sharing it. 
I said, the question is, so what? You know, really, what difference does it make? And sometimes we get frustrated when we witness. Some of you have shared that with me. I've shared my faith with maybe someone in your family, a close friend, a co-worker. It's like I'm talking to myself. It's like I'm talking to that wall. They don't hear. They don't respond. I think I'll quit. I, I'm not good at this. Let somebody else do it. I understand. I understand. But I, I want us to look at verses 32 through 34 real quickly. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered. They always will. That's just part of the human condition. Hear the gospel, some are going to sneer. But others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers, and they believed. Among them was Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus. There was also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. So I want you to know, your witness is never lost. Sometimes maybe they don't walk the aisle. Sometimes maybe they don't join the church or, or go through the waters of baptism, at least that you can see. But some believe. Some will always sneer. That's why Jesus said there are two roads. One is broad, multi-lane, and many travel on it. It leads to destruction. The other is narrow and fewer on it but it leads to eternal life. That's not up to us. That's, that's not our job. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. All our job is, is to witness and to be faithful. Holman Hunt was an artist who wrote a, a great, uh, drew a great picture of Jesus, famous picture of Jesus, and he's, he's standing at a door knocking from that text in Revelations, I, I stand at the door and knock. And, and he showed it to his friend. And his friend was looking at it and he said, uh, Holman, you made a huge mistake. He said, what is that? He said, the door. The door is all wrong. He said, what's wrong with the door? He said, there's no door handle. There's no door knob. And Holman Hunt said, uh, it's on the inside. Jesus stands at the door and knock. But you have responsibility as well. You have to open the door and invite him in. He doesn't kick it in. He didn't force himself in. You open the door and invite him in. So if you're here this morning and you've never done that, I want you to know clearly he's standing at the door and knocking. Will you open the door of your heart and invite him in today? I know I'm talking to most people here today who've done that. So I have one other question for you. Are you offering that invitation to anyone else. Paul would go on and write in Romans 10, 14. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them, without someone being a witness? We're not going to sing over oh, a thousand tongues to sing because they're not here. But you're here, and I'm here. Would you make a commitment this morning to tell it out with gladness, with your one tongue, to tell the good news of Jesus to someone else? Our hymn of invitation is hymn number 369, Tell It Out With Gladness. As we sing this hymn, if the Lord is speaking to you, calling you to decision, Come forward, I'll be standing here at the altar waiting to receive you. Maybe you just want to kneel at the altar, pray a prayer of rededication. You come as we sing together. Would you stand? Mm -hmm.